All right, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? First day of, uh, of the conference, always exciting. So, uh, you know, some great words this morning in the open and everything. So, uh, you know, excited to be here. Uh, you know, it looks like uh, the schedule jam packed. Three days of uh, some really compelling breakouts, uh, you know, meetings, uh, all that stuff. So, while you're out here, you know, take advantage of all these uh, different resources. I mean, just today, you know, I didn't realize how many the different organizations were going to be here. And so just this morning, you know, ran into DIU, ran into Bespin, ran into AFRL. So all the different opportunities out there, you know, great opportunity. So what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is we actually have options here. Because if you saw the out, outside, there was a, a real-time edit to uh, the opportunity here. So we can talk AFWorks. We can talk Software Factory. We can talk both, all right? So who wants to hear just AFWERC stuff, all right? Just software factory stuff, all right, we got one. What about a combination of both? Is that, is that compelling to people? All right, so we'll talk a little bit about both, all right? So a lot of really cool opportunities. So uh, you know, what we'll start off with was just a little AFWERCs 101 uh, to start, just show of hands, who's heard of AFWERCs? Okay, great. Who feels like they know what AFWERX is? All right, yeah, so less hands. So hopefully this will help put some context into your understanding of AFWERX. So uh, before we get started, I'd like to show you something. All right, so what we have here, one of our AFWERX hubs uh, that we operate is out of Vegas, all right? Vegas, a lot of showmanship, Got some magic people there. Penn and Teller, they have a show at the Rio. So why I like to bring this up is a lot of people see this innovation ecosystem as magic. And what I want to demonstrate to you today and hopefully get you to believe is that it's not magic. Actually, anybody can do it. And if you're willing and able to put in a little extra effort, you too can do some of this magic stuff. So, to demonstrate this, first off, could I get one volunteer in the room that wants to participate in some magic? <laughs> I think we have a staff sergeant right there in the second row. All right, so all the way from Hickam, right? Yeah. All the way from Hickam Air Force Base. So maybe the anybody further from Hickam when the travel here? <laughs> all right, we've got two people from Hickam. So for this traveler award, all right, so pick Pick a card, any card, all right? Don't tell anybody, oh. don't tell anybody. Okay. Don't tell, just in your mind. Okay. All right, pick it, all right? So I'm gonna do something really special. Well, Penn and Teller are gonna do something really special, all right? So, you remember your card? Yeah. All right, so for the first time, tell the entire audience, what was your card? Uh, King, of hearts. King of Hearts. What if I told you Penn and Teller actually removed your card so the computer's right here. Did, did anybody else choose a card? Did anybody? Did, is your card gone also? So, so what seemingly magic actually has a very simple explanation. So, so who caught on to this? Okay. So, so, so someone please share the secret. All the cards are different. Yes. So. This is a lot like what people call innovation. Whenever you see these organizations coming with solutions quickly, you're like, oh, there must be something special. There must be some magic involved. But what I want you guys to take away from this is it's not magic. It's very much just normal people with a little bit of grit getting stuff across the goal line. All right, so here, AFWERCS, organization. One of many organizations across the Air Force and the broader DOD that is helping these magic tricks to teach other people to do these magic tricks. So it's not just organizations, but we want to teach you how to deal with magic. All right, so who am I? So I'm Tony Perez. Uh, I'm a reserve major uh, just recently, so uh, 12 years active duty. Uh, KC-10 pilot is my background. So there I am, flying. I mean, desert flight suits, so somewhere over Iraq, Afghanistan, or Syria at the time, right? So how did I get into this ecosystem? Why do I care? So 
I uh, spent seven years in the KC-10 out of Travis Air Force Base. I had the opportunity and the privilege to do some of the acceptance flights for a newly modified KC-10, all right? KC-10, 70s, 80s technology. Super excited to do this. I was going out to Oklahoma City to do acceptance flights. The first time I walked into one of these newly modified KC-10s with new avionics, it looked like this. So this is what we did. We took 70s and 80s technology and moved it into the 1990s. And this was 2015-16. And so fundamentally, ask the question, as a lot of people have, I'm not unique in this sense, but can't we do better? The world's best air and space force, can't we do better than updating technology from the 70s and 80s and moving it into the 90s? Is that truly our modernization? So that's how I found myself uh, in this thing uh, they call AFWORKS now. All right, so what is AFWORKS? So AFWORKS, so you have the traditional industrial base. It's one, you know, one dimensional, whatever you want to call it. So this is a byproduct of uh, you know, World War II, the Cold War, you got the traditional industrial base. So what AFWERX tries to do, along with a lot of the different organizations across the DOD innovation ecosystem, is how do you expand that? How do you expand the traditional industrial base and to go have uh, startups operate, have academia operate, have venture capital operate and contribute to the solutions that our warfighters have? So with that and how we expanded it back in 2017, uh, the Secretary of the Air Force, along with the Chief of Staff, signed this memo, and this is how AFWERX was chartered. So if you look at bullet three, I guess bullet three made it official, it said drive innovation. All right, is this unique? No, this is something that everybody's wanted for a long time. But this is just what helped AFWERX get off the ground and start uh, moving towards this whole Air Force innovation thing. So where's AFWERX live? AFWERX lives out of the Pentagon, so it's out of half A8, uh, AAI is the actual three letter. We're uh, currently uh, Lieutenant General Harris, who's uh, retiring soon. It's going to be Lieutenant General Mahone here shortly. All right, so that's where AFWERX lives organizationally. So, what is AFWERX? AFWERX is a fusion of capabilities that connects innovators and accelerates results for air force, culture, and technology. All right, so a couple key things here a fusion of capabilities. So what you're going to see from AFWERX and why it's difficult to uh, wrap your arms around is it's a fusion of different products or capabilities. All right, so we have, we're not just one thing, we're many different things. And those things change. Uh, we add some, we get rid of some, but AFWERX is a fusion of various capabilities that connects innovators and accelerates results. AFWERX is not a project management program. Like we are not a program office. We have a very small team. So what we try to do is take the existing infrastructure, the existing organizations, and we try to augment those teams, and we try to connect the various dispersed organizations that are trying to get stuff done to the warfighter and the MAGCOMs. And then we try to accelerate results. How do we take what the organization has been doing for all these decades, knock off the rust, and make them useful tools to actually deliver solutions out to the fight? And not only in technology, but also culture. This is where we think it's a, it's a large cultural play that uh, we need in order to actually move the needle with innovation for the Air Force. All right, so how do you think of this? Fusion of capabilities, all right? So the best analog that I, uh, that I have is Google, all right? Who knows Google's parent company? How are they actually publicly traded? Alphabet, Alphabet right, okay. So Alphabet, so everybody thinks Google. No, Google's actually Alphabet. This is, and this, is, this makes up the whole Google enterprise. Look how many different things are there. So you got YouTube, Waymo, Google X, Android. All these things, independent products, but can work cross-functionally if required. Also, Alphabet can add products or take away products. They're not sold on any one thing, all right? So this is similar to how AFWERX is organized. AFWERX, you can see we have all these different products. So we have Spark Cells. We work with the MAGCOMs through these things that we call TIDs, Technology Integration Detachments. We have Virtual Tools. We have Spark Tank, Innovation Hubs, Design Challenges. We run Tech Accelerators, Cyber. We got into that. And then we have Agile Contracting uh, Pathways. 
So if you want to organize this in your mind in a more uh, pipeline approach is we have uncovering opportunities, connecting with real options, and transitioning solutions. All right. So to overlay it one more time, what do we really have and why do I, uh, what are we trying to do? At the end of the day, we have demand, supply, and then we have a bridge between the two. And so Afrox is covered down on all three of those things. So we try to bring supply and demand together. So supply, we have access to a lot of companies that can deliver real solutions to the warfighter. On the demand side, we work with the program offices, we work with the managed comps, we work with the bases to figure out what the actual needs are. And then we find agile contracting pathways in order to bridge those two things. So what's a real world example of this happening? Those cross-functional Afrox teams actually delivering a solution. All right, so I'm gonna use an example of a drone. All right, so with our hub in Vegas, so hub, uh, off-base location, we created a, we did a problem curation workshop, all right? They defined that, hey, we needed to augment and help perimeter security for Air Force bases. Through that, they made a very well-defined problem. They ran an AFROX challenge, so challenges are like DARPA-X challenges, public challenges that anybody can uh, apply to. From that challenge, they held an event where they invited and down, they down selected from the challenge and invited about 80 companies to Vegas in a showcase. One of the companies that was invited to that showcase was Easy Aerial. Easy Aerial then got further down selected and invited back to showcase their technology to more Air Force and DOD stakeholders. One of those stakeholders was Travis Air Force Base. They had a spark cell. These spark cells are grassroots base level innovation organizations. The security forces at Travis Air Force Base said, hey, this is super interesting technology. What Easy Aerial had was a drone in a box. That was completely autonomous. It could be triggered through either optical or other sensors and then go see what's going on. Travis Air Force Base said, hey, this is interesting. Let us test this out for you. So through some agile contracting pathways, they got on contract through the SIBR process, and this picture here is actually the people that are the most underappreciated people in the innovation ecosystem, the contracting, finance, and legal folks. They executed a contract in OT in under a month and actually delivered Easy Aerial to Travis Air Force Base. Three million dollar contract. The rest of the story, which, uh, is a longer story is they ran into some issues with the drone moratorium <laughs> but that's we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later they're going to overcome that one but so, so that's an example of afrox uh capabilities or products working together in order to deliver a solution but afrox does not do it alone not any one of those capabilities that afrox has works in a vacuum it's in conjunction with other organizations within the broader DOD innovation ecosystem. We have MGM Works right here, Steve, up front. That's, that's another great innovation organization that you should reach out to. DIU's here, Defense Innovation uh, Unit, which is an OSD level organization, another great partner. We leverage SIBR, Small Business Innovation Research, a program that's been around ever since the early 80s. Again, that's not an Afrox thing. That's just something Afrox has partnered with in order to enable the activity, in order to enable us to get solutions out to the fight quicker. So what's our model? How, how does Afrox look at it? So it's not linear. You know, if you want to see a flow chart, it's not going to happen. But what we can do is say, we have a hypothesis. We, have, we, we work on this hypothesis that if you can identify and get commitments from these five nodes, it's going to increase the probability of the success of any one project. All right, so what are these five nodes? I probably can't read them all the way on the back, so I'll, I'll read them to you. All right, so we've got the entrepreneur, a different color because it's perhaps the most important of the five nodes. So the entrepreneur is the problem owner, the person that actually wants to see a solution. This is what we're going to do. The, because we have a very small team at AFWorks, we support entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are just entrepreneurs internal to a large bureaucracy. Guess what? The Air Force is a large bureaucracy. So we want to leverage entrepreneurs. We want to rally resources around them because that's how we scale 
in a distributed innovation uh, model. All right, so entrepreneur, problem owner. Contract and legal, like I talked about in the last slide, those are perhaps the most important folks that are gonna enable things to happen above board. Afrox has no special button that says, oh, this is an Afrox project because it's gonna, so it gets fast-tracked or anything. No, we work within the existing processes and we believe we have to. That's the only way that we're gonna prove that there's ways to do things right and at scale is to use the uh, existing infrastructure. So you better believe that we work very closely with our contracting folks and legal folks. Of which I'm neither, but anybody can learn. If a pilot can learn a little bit about legal and contract, anybody can, all right? So contracting and legal. Leadership engagement. All right, so leadership engagement, where's that, you know, how's that fit in? It's not, I mean, the leadership they need to support and provide a level of protection for that entrepreneur to operate. So any project, leadership needs to see themselves as a, as a, through the venture capital lens, right? They are an investor. If there's a project that they want to go after, do they need to execute and actually create, do the project? No. They're not going to be the action officer, but they can invest resources to that entrepreneur in order to enable that activity. So what can they invest? Surely, yes, money, yeah, that's great, okay? If leadership does have money, that, that's awesome. Maybe more importantly, time, white space. Give that entrepreneur white space in order to execute. Maybe lastly, what other resource does leadership have? Just support, support goes a long way. And just publicly saying that this project is important to me, that's something leadership can do. Technology partner. Technology partners can be internal, they can be external. They could be someone right at your base. So I know at Travis Air Force Base, we had uh, just getting ops and maintenance to talk together, not realizing that, oh my gosh, right here, just literally a building away, that's my technology partner that can get to a solution. Or it could be off base, it could be someone in Silicon Valley that you might have never met. They could have a novel solution that is gonna enable you to uh, enhance your mission. And lastly is a resource advocate. So even though leadership could have money, they don't necessarily have the money. Resource advocate, can, the, the, the actual resources, the money, fiscal resources, could come from a different organization. It could come from CIBR, it could come from the program offices, it could come from the MAGCOM. Also thinking with resource advocate is the sustainment piece of that. All right, so the, all these things, all these five nodes work together in order to increase the probability of any one project success. All right, you notice I said, I, I'm not saying that, hey, this is gonna guarantee it. Nothing's gonna be guaranteed in this space. But if we can identify and get commitments from these five nodes, we believe you can increase the probability of success. Last but not least is roadblocks. I mean, that's just a fact of life, right? So, you know, think legal, moral, ethical, policy, instructions. These are all things that are real, that you have to, you, you can't just ignore. If you just ignore them and go around them, no one's gonna believe your solution is, is viable. So make sure you identify the roadblocks and address them head on or figure out a way around them. All right, so you're like, oh great, Tony, this is awesome. Got all this good stuff, you know, got all these great slides. What is this based on? So I'm here to tell you that this is based on some, some pretty compelling uh, academic research. All right, so where do we start? So let's start with the uh, innovator's dilemma. Who, who's read this book? All right, so yeah, so we got a couple of hands out here. So really good book, and this is what I challenge, uh, you know, Audible, you can listen to it. There's actually even shorter versions at Blink List. There's a lot of opportunities to get the succinct version of this book. Really good. So what it says is for disruptive innovation to happen, there's basically two ways you can do it. You can either have a complete spin-off with your an existing bureaucracy, or you have to acquire a brand new offering. Within the Air Force, probably the easiest way to do it is a complete spin-off, and that's kind of what Afrox is, is a complete spin-off of the traditional system, all right? But it is difficult. That's what this book uh, teaches us. Drive by Daniel Pink. Drive is really interesting, because how do you motivate people in our current society, all right? So we are in a multi-generational workforce. And guess what? Each generation is motivated by different things. 
The Air Force, interestingly enough, I guess the majority of our workforce is probably under the age of 30. Perhaps, I mean, and then even more under 35. So how do we leverage them in order to execute the mission that we know we have to do? All right. So what Drive talks about is three things. People want autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So think about that as you're trying to motivate projects. Team of teams. All right, General McChrystal. Organizations are most effective when the workforce is empowered to work across silos and make decisions at the lowest levels. Another really interesting concept. You know, if you read this book, the secret is this is actually how Al Qaeda has organized themselves. So how do we use those principles in order to create a more agile organization and get solutions quicker out to the warfighter? All right, two books here. Anti-fragile and nudge, all right? Both loosely tied to behavioral economic concepts. All right. Anti-fragile talks about complex system and how they react. We are in a complex system. Any ecosystem is a complex environment. The beautiful thing about complexity is there's nonlinear relationships. So any input, you don't necessarily know what the output's going to be. You know, you could put in a one, you could get a million. You could put in a one, you could get a negative million, right? It's nonlinear effects. And it's impossible to really tell what's going to happen. However, how do we take advantage of nonlinear upsides? And this is where nudge comes in. So anti-fragile talks about nonlinearity and complex environments. Nudge talks about how do we put in place, how do we design to defaults or other parental libertarian methods in order to nudge people and increase the probability of the upside of complex systems. And last but not least, lean startup methodology. All right, so you got two lean startup books here. You got Eric Rez and uh, Steve Blank, both uh, you know, great minds in the lean startup uh, world. And so this is methodology that uh, startups use in order to scale fast and everything. So uh, this just says we can increase the probability of success by taking an iterative, user-centric approach. All right, so how do we think about this in Air Force terms? All right, so, you know, Everybody says, oh, our acquisition cycles are so long. Oh, you know, it, it takes uh, you know, so long and we have to align with the palm and all that stuff. So all these are true things. But let's think about how we can change things and make uh, work within the existing structure in order to take iterative approaches to deliver solutions. And if we think creatively, we can actually get after some of those ways. All right, fail fast, fail forward, fail cheaply. That's a more provocative way to say it. And then failure is not an option, it's a, it's a requirement. So, you know, two more provocative ways to think of uh, lean startup methodology. All right, so I am, all right, so I still got time. So pause there uh, for, that's kind of the AFRIX 101. I think the biggest thing to take away from AFRIX is uh, small group, different capabilities, uh, we're spread out all around the country. It's active duty, guard, reserve, um, out of half A8. It's kind of the big takeaways. And then, you know, we're here to help out. So if you have a, we're not going to take on projects, but if you need help doing something or you want your team augmented or supported or you want access to some of these, uh, help us help you uncover some of these tools, you know, we can definitely do that. All right. So with that, because I got more time. I guess we'll go into different uh, deep thoughts, all right? Or, or we can go into um, DevOps factories, software factories. All right, we'll go into deep thoughts. All right, so as within your organizations, uh, as you're you know, thinking about innovation, how do you innovate within your organization, right? So uh, define innovation, all right? So you know, that's one of these things, and you know, I always hesitate to think about innovation you know, actually just uh, saying it because it's, it's such an overused, uh, you know, buzz, uh, buzzword right now. So just, I mean, this doesn't have to be your definition, but this is one that I think about is it's rapidly turning a novel idea into something the warfighter uses. All right. So rapid, there's a speed aspect to it. Novel idea, it's a new offering. And then perhaps the, the, the biggest piece is something the warfighter uses. So until you operationalize that, or you actually have an impact on mission, you know, what are we doing? 
So always think about how do we take it, even though it might not get fielded because you might learn something that says, hey, this shouldn't be used operationally, but you should always be uh, moving that direction. All right, and then innovation, it's, it's very intimidating when you ask someone to innovate, right? So think about it, this is something, the horizons innovation, just a way to think about it. You know, you're not always gonna be thinking about time travel or uh, some other novel concept. There's, think of it in three horizons. So you have horizon one, two, and three. So horizon one, think incremental, all right? So what this chart actually says, it says existing technology that is, uh, we currently use and deploy within the existing market. That's kind of like, this is a known known that we're just kind of implementing, all right? The next one is, it's something that we know, but we're not currently deployed in that space, all right? That's horizon two. So if you say horizon one is going from, uh, you know, like pencils to pens, horizon two would be going from like a, a gas-powered car to a Tesla. All right, horizon three, that's an absolute disruptive innovation. This is really difficult because it's unknown unknowns. By definition, you actually don't know whether something's gonna be disruptive or not because you don't know the market actually exists if you think of it through, um, uh, through company terms. So as you are going after various innovations within your organization, something to think about is portfolio management. You know, what percent of your portfolio should go after horizon one, two, and three? So, you know, uh, Peter Newell, a gentleman that uh, led the uh, Army's rapid, uh, acquisi uh, rapid equipment force uh, back in early 2000s, someone that's been, uh, he says 70, 20, 10. 70% 70 incremental, 10% uh, horizon two, and 10% uh, disruptive, all right? You all have you know, different missions and different everything, so you know, just, but just something to consider. Think about portfolio management within your, uh, your innovation portfolio. All right, thought two, build the team. All right, I've already hinted on this. Not one Avenger is gonna take down, uh, I, I can't think of his name. The Thanos, yes. It took a whole team of them, right? So who's your Tony Stark? You know, who's your Captain America? It's gonna be everybody, you know, you need everybody. Not, every, not any one person can cover down on any, all those things. So I'd venture to say legal, contracting, finance. Those are three that you have to have. Com, user, you need, uh, uh, OSI is another one as you start working with uh, non-traditional folks. So think about that. Think about the local team you need to build in order to, to get after true innovation. PA is another one, public affairs, very key. All right, find early adopters. Because you're not gonna be able to do it all on your own, you need a team of folks. So who are the right people to bring in, all right? Because there's a very simple math equation to determine who the right early adopter is, all right? The good news is this gentleman right here in the front row boiled it down for us. And so if you had to look at it from just uh, your uh, typical bell curve, all right, so really we're working with two standard deviations on the left, all right? It's a very small percent, especially early on when you don't have the resources in order to participate uh, like you would like, all right? You need people that, are four multipliers in this. So I'd venture to say uh, two deviations to the left. So I mean, you're looking at maybe two to 5% of the people that are gonna be effective in this space. All right, who knows what this is? Shackleton, all right. Who, who knows who Shackleton is? Raise your hands. All right, so this gentleman right here, this is the endurance. It's an Arctic mission, absolutely incredible. Uh, they had, they, they basically shipwrecked, ice came in, and there's, you know, a hundred and some men, and they all survived. Months in Antarctica, they made it to uh, civilization with no help except themselves. Absolutely incredible. These were the early adopters you need. How did Shackleton get these individuals? Legend has it, he put out an ad. And this ad, because it's probably hard to read it, I'll just read it to you. Men wanted. For hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful. Honor and recognition in case of success. Absolutely incredible. So think about that as you're building your teams. 
Think of what Shackleton did. Execute on good enough. All right, what's this? This is a building a plane in flight. This is how it feels like a lot of the time whenever you're doing this stuff, right? Whether you're in a DevOps software factory, whether you're doing whatever it is in the innovation space, it feels like you're building it in flight. And you probably are, but it's okay. So how do you figure out where to allocate your resources? For those uh, CPI practitioners, you, you might recognize this, but there's an impact and effort, all right? So if you had to look at it, high impact, low effort, those are Superman type projects. High impact, high effort, Batman, because Batman, he's just human, but he had big impact. So it was hard for him to do it, but he had big impact. So Batman projects, Hulk projects, a lot of effort to make that guy mean and green, and then he caused as much damage as he did uh, you know, good stuff, so that's why it's kind of like lower impact. Then you got Buzz Lightyear projects, all right? So think about this. As you have a portfolio of projects that you want to get after, because you can't get them after all of them, where do you dedicate your resources as you're building your plane in flight? So take all your projects, have your teams map them out on this impact effort uh, chart, and then just work top left to bottom right. The things that are top left, those are where you get your most bang for your buck, all right? Bottom right, a lot of effort, little impact, not waste your time. Don't waste your time, all right? More interestingly, you could have your leadership, your, your champion there, plot the exact same projects across this exact same uh, chart. And this actually uncovers some pretty interesting conversations, all right? So why is A, in the eyes of the people wanting to do the project, very impactful and low effort, whereas as far as leadership goes, it's, it's F. So those are conversations that are really interesting and valuable to have as you pursue your innovation activities. Failure will happen, all right. So how do we, failures will happen, all right. This is the lean startup approach, build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn. Because we're in a software factory briefing too, this is the DevOps little infinity symbol. There's all these great charts you could use in order to show, you know, like uh, this, this great learning and creating and everything. You know, pick one, go with it, you know, use that in order to help understand and frame what you're doing. Um, thinking of it through the, the VC lens, all right, so venture capital, this is, you know, who invests in startups to make billions of dollars, right? So, you, in, the, in the blue dots, you have the dollars invested, this is 2011, in billions of dollars. The purple number of companies invested in, yellow is the total number of startups. All right? So what you see is, out of all the startups in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, you have over 3,400. VCs only invested in 430 of them. All right? And then of those 430, I guarantee you how most VCs look at their portfolios, 5 to 10% success rate. They are actually throwing millions of dollars down the drain knowing that 90 to 95% of the things that they invest in will fail. But because of complex environments and nonlinear upsides, it is worth the investment. All right, rethink the frozen middle. Frozen middle. Everybody points to them. This is why we can't do anything, right? This is why I would be so successful if it wasn't for, and point your finger to whatever organization or whatever person. I would ask you to rethink that. Because I know for a fact that I have been the frozen middle before. As forward leaning and as you know, innovative mind as I think I am, I have definitely told someone no, or said you can't do that. So how do you work with that individual? How do you complement their efforts? How do you understand that, that whoever you're calling is the frozen middle, that they're great Americans too, and actually they probably have the AFIs on their side, especially early on in this innovation movement? How do you work with them in order to accomplish the goals that you uh, seek out, all right? So it takes a team. So instead of vilifying them, work with them. So rethink the frozen middle. Uh, this is a nod to uh, the DevOps thing. So choose a name wisely. All right. So how do you get a successful um, uh, organization, right? And this is this is to the DevOps 
uh, focused in, in the group. All right. So, you know, uh, so you've heard of Kessel Run. You've probably heard of Bespin. You've probably heard of Dardana. Uh, there's Tron out there. So, you know, you got the Star Wars references, Lord of the Rings. So choose a name wisely. And, and there, there's a chart to, to actually uh, codify this, all right? So uh, this was a, a, a Stanford study, I believe. All right, so success of the organization uh, versus the geek index, all right? So pop culture, if you just go pop culture, okay, there's some success there, but you know, that's like, that's going like, you know, this, this is like Ray and you know, uh, the, the current Star Wars series, right? Yeah, you're gonna get some people, but it's not, you know, you're gonna get some movement, not much. Retro sci-fi, now you start getting growth, all right? If you can go to the 70s, 80s Star Wars movies, okay, now people, now you're talking cross-generationally. Now you're gonna get more buy-in. Sci-fi requiring a Google search. If someone now has to Google search it, now you have, you're tapping into the geeks you want and people are interested enough to where they're gonna, they might fund you. But don't go too far. If you go to like cosplay and LARPing, that's probably a little too far, so I, I, would, I would venture to stay away from that much. You can go too far on the geek scale uh, based on the research. All right, so parting thoughts. All right, uh, anybody know this, this guy? All right, Keynesian economics. All right, so, so this is a John Maynard Keynes, right? So uh, he, he was an economist uh, during a very interesting time during the Depression. And so, uh, you know, what he, uh, of the many things that he did, it's, you know, how do we incorporate policy and how do we actually uh, nudge capitalistic markets in a way to cause the growth that we need, especially think about during the, the, the time of the Depression, all right, when things were stuck in a rut. One of the interesting observations he made was worldly wisdom teaches that it's better for reputation to fail conventionally than to succeed unconventionally. So think about that. It is easier for us as human beings to fail in a conventional way than to go out on a limb and take risk and succeed unconventionally. So, as we go forward, and why is this important? Who knows what this is? Yeah, so this is a, this is a picture of CENTCOM. So this year, so we've been in this conflict for how long? 2001, right? We've been taking a very conventional approach at this conflict. This year there's individuals signing up for the Air Force that when you ask them where they were on September 11th, they will not have an answer for you because they were not alive. So as you move forward and as you explore this great conference, meet new people and going after these great new technologies and trying to move the needle for innovation for the Air Force so we can stay relevant against peer actors, consider that. Consider that you might have to do unpopular things, act unconventionally in order to help us succeed. All right. So thank you very much. That is everything. And I will stick around for, uh, yeah, we'll do questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, resource advocate. Yeah, so, uh, so the question is for the, for the sustainment piece. So the fact of the matter is I think the whole uh, DOD innovation ecosystem has proven pretty successfully that we can rapidly prototype stuff. But how do you actually on-ramp it into the traditional system? So uh, the answer is I think that's what we're trying to do now. So I, I think a lot of the efforts, uh, whether it's DIU, whether it's us, whether it's any organization, is trying to figure out how we bridge that and on-ramp it into the PEOs. And uh, actually, uh, PEO Bez has been a great partner in trying to explore that. Uh, but it doesn't really mesh that well with uh, the incentive structure that they're built around, right? So uh, 
The short answer is I don't know. Well, actually, how about this? Get the, get the, the sustainers, the procurers and the sustainers in the room early. Uh, they're, it's going to be outside their, their conventional wheelhouse and purview of what they're going to be looking at. But get, at least let them know. Like know who, you know, you're a cyber work, sir. So, you know, the PEO Digital is a great partner. PEO uh, Bez is another great partner. Uh, rapid sustainment office. So I think bringing the, the AFMC side of the house together and partner with them and make their life easier. I mean, that's a, a eventually, what, I mean, that's what we have to do is make it easy for them to say yes. That, that's how you get to the sustainment piece, but it's bringing them on the team early. Sir. Ted Cummings with MuleSoft. Uh, it looked like you did a little bit of a punt on the policy and regulations. You were suggesting that oh, we always have to work in the frameworks. Is AppWorks playing any role in highlighting to the proponent office of these policies and regulations where they could improve the policies and regulations and modernize those into the evolving and uh, thanks. So the question is: Is Afric's playing a role in shaping uh, policy? In, in and I'll expand that out to, to law. So uh, the answer is uh, uh, yes, and not alone. I, I think as a lot of these different organi uh, innovation organizations are going out trying different things. I mean, we are finding out that within our existing infrastructure that. Uh, due to uh, supplemental instructions and other things, we're, we're our own worst enemy at a lot of times, or interpretation of certain things. So really all we have to do, so I think Cibber is a perfect example. Cibber is something that's been around for a long time. It, had, it's a, uh, it's, it lost its usefulness because of uh, just over, um, people thought they had to use it in a certain way. So how I see that Afrox did with Cibber was they took it as like a rusty bike in the, in the garage, took it out, uh, threw some oil on it, you know, made it useful again. But ultimately, Afrox is not a, doesn't want to be involved in Cibber. They don't want to take over Cibber. We just want to uh, try to make it a useful tool for everybody again. But yeah, I mean, you know, uh, we work with uh, the LL folks, but it, it is in concert with uh, many different innovation organizations to help try to inform what that policy and law should be so we can um, uh, do, do the things that you're talking about. All right. Other questions or comments? Sir. So, Tony, uh, you've got an app person in Austin, for example. Is, uh, are these offices, uh, for those of us that have traditionally been in a, a world, let's say, of waterfall or trying to, trying to uh, get beyond that, uh, you know, primarily in the Air Force, for us, uh, accept visitors? I mean, can, can, you, can you go to these locations and try to drill down some more? Yes, you can. And you know, and what I gave you is a very top level, you know, it's the uh, balance of AFRUX and just kind of innovation philosophy as a whole. Uh, but uh, yes, I mean, you can, where are you located at? Okay, yeah, so, so go to Austin. Uh, you know, they can help out. Uh, Vegas is another good place. Um, uh, DC, they're not going to, uh, I mean, there's not big teams there. But you know, they, they can connect you to the resources if you want to uh, drill down a little bit more. And, really uh, to get you to the pathways you need in order to succeed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, great, thanks. All right, other questions? All right. Well, uh, I appreciate uh, everybody's time. You know, I'll, I'll hang out here for, uh, until no one comes up, but uh, thank you very much. Enjoy uh, the next uh, two days of the conference. All right, thank you.